my hat I will wear the green willow And all around my hat For a twelvemonth and a day And if anyone should ask me The reason why I'm wearing it you know, if I say, if anybody ever says to me, what are you? And I say, I'm a musician. And they say, what would you play with? And I say, Steel Ice Band. And they go, oh, all around my hat. The Queen said it was um, such jolly tunes, which uh, <laughs> when we met her, met her once, and I think um, that kind of side of what we do is, is like that. It has a certain vitality. I've heard, I, can't, I couldn't even sing you the, the, the verses, and I've heard it thousands of times. And I just scrape away at my fiddle and and enjoy it. <laughs> It's all for my true love, who's far, far away. Chunk, chunk. <laughs> Maddie put the song together. I mean, Maddie was, um, she put two songs together. It was a song called Farewell Here and a song called Around My Hat. I looked up the song because I liked the tune and the words were fairly boring. So I decided that I'd get some other words to another song that I knew and fit it with the chorus and the tune. And the words to the verses have got nothing whatever in common with the chorus. <laughs> it doesn't make any sort of sense at all. But as they always say, it's sound, sound over sense. And that's a perfect example of it. <laughs> I mean, this is all around my hat. Maddie's happily sang this, and I just sort of suggest, why don't we do it sort of... And they sort of went, yeah, and the drums joined in, Rick joined in on bass, and... It's only a couple of chords, so it wasn't a... He didn't have to write anything down. We tried various things. Rick sort of, eventually, we, we, we couldn't kind of quite make it do anything. And then Rick said, what about making it 6-8? And, uh, and then everybody, and then it was off, it, off and running, and it was great. And it was fairly radical to do that at the time. We were having difficulty finding what to do with it because there was no tempo arranged and there was no um, time signature arranged, no key. And I remember thinking, after a, three or four different tries at half time. that kind of thing. Um, in the end, I said, well, why don't we try it 6-8? And I didn't know what 6-8 was at the time. What I said was, why don't we try it like? Kind of thing, which, which apparently is 6-8. They tell me afterwards. Okay, so that's, uh, and it works straight away. So that's my only claim to uh, contribution, really. My role in that was really, obviously, as an electric guitarist with a rock background as much as anything else, supplying that end of it um, wholeheartedly and unashamedly, you know, with a distorted guitar digging in and doing, you know, what I thought of as a, as a rock boogie riff. <laughs>
<laughs> All Around My Hat was the very first time I worked with Steel Eye. They came to me, uh, it was actually uh, Tim and Maddie who met with me and said, you know, we'd like you to produce us. And I had been doing lots of things with the Wombles at that time. And it was kind of a nice change to have a band of their, should we say, credibility come to me and say, we, we like the productions you did with the Wombles. Can you come and produce us? The man behind the Wombles musically is Mike Bat. This is not Batman, this is Super Wumble! a nice way of moving on and away from that for a while um, and it was clear that they wanted me to try and bring the sort of drum sounds that I was using before that to them and um, the sort of rhythm section I've always been very strong on underpinning records with a strong rhythm section you will know it's super wumble cause his name is on his best he can I was very pleased to find it. We found it by accident. I just happened to buy a Womble album almost for a joke and listen to it, expecting to fall about laughing. I thought, we found that we were looking for a producer. We've been looking for a good producer for years. And now I'm listening to the Wombles and thinking, this is the man to produce Steely. He's got great sensitivity. He, he sort of um, adds, he doesn't want to impose his, he doesn't have a production style per se. He, he, he um, enhances whatever he's producing. And this is what we've been looking for and couldn't find. Steel Eye had lots of different factions, all pulling and moving, some of them against each other, which made it interesting. You know, they had people in the band who got on like bosom buddies and other people that sort of tolerated each other. And part of my job was to sort of be, be the sort of, almost like a sort of mediator sometimes and settle quarrels and wipe noses and that sort of thing. <laughs> It was like an intuitive knowing. As soon as it was finished, in the rehearsal room, it just felt extraordinarily like a hit. It was this old sort of, you know, wonderful corny thing where you go, it's gonna be a hit. Yeah, it sounds like a hit to me. This one actually did. You had this chunky underpinning guitar, the, the very bright, wonderful solo, violin solo. You had Maddie's voice, which was very clear and clean and kind of sassy. And so it really, there was a message there. I don't mean a political message, but it was a powerful record. And the chunky harmonies as well, which really gave it a kind of star quality, which um, when it went into the charts, as powerfully as it did, um, I don't think we were surprised. We, we weren't arrogantly expecting it, but we weren't surprised when it happened. I rather thought, well, of course it would do. You know, I was kind of fairly arrogant at the time. We thought this was music was great, and what was the problem? I mean, the record company <laughs> were absolutely gobsmacked, I think, because they didn't think it would do anything. I remember the first time that we played the song, we were doing a festival in Liverpool in the outdoors, and we went on and did the show, and towards the end of the set, we played All Around My Hat, which was the first time we'd ever played it on a stage, and the audience responded in the most extraordinary way. And it was quite obvious. I mean, you'd have to have been deaf and blind, you know, to not release that. We just walked off the stage. I mean, never had any song that we'd done got that response. And so we got on things like Top of the Pops, and it was... And I thought this was great. I thought that was exactly where we should be. <laughs> We worked very hard. We were flying off here and there and 
singing it in fountains and squares in New York and sort of ev everywhere, you know, all around my hat, took over completely. It was hysterical, is what I always think of it as. Um, it was like hysteria surrounded everything because everyone was suddenly went crazy. Every, we were wearing bizarre clothes, everyone was going mad with the clothes, all satin and stacked boots and, uh, you know, and I was floating around in stuff and it was all great fun. <laughs> I really enjoyed myself. It was crazy. It was crazy. People used to give me hats because I wore hats anyway. Uh, I remember once coming off stage in San Diego and as I walked kind of through the audience bit to get to the bar quickly, rather than go back to the dressing room where I knew the beer was fairly indifferent, uh, somebody put a J.D. Stetson, the proper white, beautiful hat, and uh, I had it for a couple of years before somebody took it as a souvenir at the Albert Hall. What's that? All around my hat was That's where it was. Was it? Mm -hmm. No, it wasn't. Oh, I'm afraid it was. No, it wasn't. No. All around my hat I will wear the green willow and all around my hat for a twelve month and a day, etc. <laughs> I just remembered my harmony as we stopped. Oh, right. There you go. If anyone should ask me. The oh, reason okay. why I'm wearing it. All right, let's see. No, 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 no. All, all right, and again. All around my hat. All, all, Two, all, three, three four. four. All, all around my, my hat. hat. I will wear the green willow and all around my hat for a twelve month and a day. Any hit seems to put the stamp of approval um, for ordinary folk, you know, on, on the band. And, and we became, you know, the household name, you know, Steel Ice Band, all around my hat. Well, the concerts got bigger, the... Um the whole thing started rolling. I mean, you need you need that sort of catalyst to just lift you up to another level of public awareness, which it did. And I think that song um, made the woman that was standing at the sink that wasn't interested in traditional music, um, as she's washing up, she hears it on the radio, and she goes, oh, all around my hat, and she's quite happy to do that, whereas she probably wouldn't get into some of the, the ballads that, that we've done that, that mean the world to us. We'd just come through glam rock, in the 73, 74, 75, still prevalent. But there were an awful lot of influences at work uh, in there that made it actually quite tolerant of different uh, genres of music. And one of them was folk rock, which uh, Steel Eye were the main, or one of the main purveyors. All Around My Hat gave, it put us on a par with most of the successful chart sort of bands and put us into a new market and people took us more seriously from a commercial point of view, which they hadn't. They sort of said, well, you know, it's very successful, but it's, there's a limit to it because we're not a singles band. And then suddenly we had a single and uh, they started to take us seriously. It sort of moved us out of the folk world in a way as well. It established us as a band in our own right, um, as distinct from being just attached to the folk world. So it, it gave us a, a slightly broader spectrum. Im eigenen Land konnten sie mit ihrer Platte nichts werden und in Holland sind sie in den Charts. Hier ist die Live Band mit All Around My Hat. I mean, it was from that point, Steel I, Steel, I went up steadily. We had a very long, steady rise until All Around My Hat. And then a very quick decline after All Around My Hat, because we didn't follow up, we didn't have another single, and we weren't that way. The record company said, what's the next one? And we, we had no idea. We'd ne we hadn't set out to write a single or compose a single, create a single. And we'd know we didn't have a formula. And so we didn't have a follow-up. And so it just it slowly declined after that. The audiences started to drop off, and it's never picked up since then. Now, that was jolly good at the time. A reasonable amount of money. But I would say that the repercussions, artistically, springing on and going down through the years, have limited our ability to sometimes put across to an audience the essence of some of the more serious side of traditional music. Well, this is what happens with a hit, yes. I mean, it becomes a bit of an albatross. You, you, you're stuck with the bloody thing. You have to play every concert whether you want to or not. So it, I mean, it does have a disadvantage, and but I, I don't know. It, it upsets the balance within the band as well. It was 
apart from Maddie, there wasn't a focus for the band. Suddenly the sort of ego started to go mad and and the workload was incredible as well. That's the other thing, that we'd worked at the pace we wanted to work at and suddenly media was demanding that we work at an, an impossible rate. And it was about a year after that, the band just packed up for a while and said, we can't take it anymore. We, you know, we can't do three Americas and three Australias and five Europes and four UKs in a year and make two albums. It was absurd. And we just wore ourselves out and as you get tired, so you get ratty with each other and it really doesn't help a band. When you're in your late twenties and you're going around the world and you're trying, you know, however serious you are about the music, it's it's a great reward to have this money and this acclaim and it's you know we're all human and we like a little bit a little bit of fame is quite nice at the time. So one can be drawn into that, and one can try to reproduce that. But if it was not an inherent part of your raison d'être in the first place. Then we get to the tricky areas. So we get people constantly then, over the next 20 years, urging you to try to make another hit. But the hit was an unusual thing. It grew out of... I, I think it was, it was a success in the sense that very few traditional songs, traditional folk songs, have ever got into any charts in the world ever and been made commercially acceptable and liked by lots of people. And that's it. It's all down to that one. All around my hat. I mean, after the event, it's all very easy to say, oh yes, well, of course, you know, but, but the slightest thing different with All Around My Hat could have made the difference between success and failure. And we took songs like Hard Times of Old England, which had a similar beat to them, and we released those as singles. We put out Thomas the Rhymer as a single. We put out New York Girls as a single, with Peter Sellers playing ukulele. But nothing, nothing happened with these things. You know, a few radio plays here and there, and that was the end of that. Um, so All Around My Hat happened by accident. I mean, the name of your programme, Single Luck, is is very appropriate because i think that things uh, certainly in our case do happen like that i think that if if the intention is right then with with making music then i think that people uh, that comes through in the music and i think people hear it as a as a genuine honest to goodness musical statement that has no hidden agenda about commerciality or whatever and there is nothing um, false about it in any way and all around my hat was like that and I think as soon as you start thinking this could you know this could be a hit or you start trying to write a hit you start trying to please other people and once you start doing that I don't think you get the best from yourself and also you get seen to being um, a, a one-hit band which really was kind of just an aside from our main energy, which was about albums, really. We were always an album band, and uh, that was... We just happened to hit lucky on that, if you like. I mean, it's not that we didn't want to, it has to be said, but our energy was so much more focused on making the sort of music we wanted to make, which wasn't in the mainstream. I mean, what we do isn't. It's a, it's a kind of hope against hope that, that you would get a hit doing the kind of thing we do. You know, we all needed a break and a rest, and we did stop for a while. Um, certainly Peter and I left for a while, um, a couple of years. The band carried on to fulfil some, some contractual dates, and then it stopped. The first thing is that if we'd used all the ideas, that, because we're a great ideas band, a lot of people throwing ideas in, and I think if we'd used all the ideas, especially commercial ideas, um, I think we could have been in a very, very kind of rockistocracy position by now. But, but of course, when you're not hungry in the sense that there are, there's always a wage, as they say, then it's not quite so important to kind of push the limits in, in the same way as if you were kind of struggling 
as I as uh, I've learned since, you know. The thing was that it was our we were companions. We in fact we bought a house together before we were involved. We were always good friends, more yeah. than anything. We've yeah. always laughed a lot together. That's always been our. Um, We've been drunk in gutters all around <laughs> the world, as it happens. And uh, I think that was one of the binding. Alcohol was one of the binding substances. Yes, and uh, and the music was obviously that we we had had similar taste. All around my hat for a twelve month. Status quo covering it was 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 great because really I suppose it was their energy that we used in the first place in the funny. So it's a sort of like a circle completed if you like. And it was great to be on tour with them. I loved being on stage with them. There was nothing like that. <laughs> What I do now, I um, I record my own music and I do gigs outside the band and I love the band and I, I'll always work to give the band material and and to keep it going. Well, I think we'll be doing another album next year and uh, we, we have some festivals this summer and another October tour, so we, we keep, you know, just keeps going really. I'm just about to do a TV series of Watership Down, the music for it and Bright Eyes, which I wrote for the original film of Watership Down, is being resurrected, and we're going to record it with Stephen from Boyzone, and I'm writing a set of other songs and a symphonic score for the 26 half hours of animation. I um, live a very quiet life in the Canary Islands. I'm writing, I'm writing books, and uh, I've just built a house which has kept me busy for the last couple of years. And, um... Do as little as possible, really, live a quiet life. That's, uh, I've had enough of rushing around the world doing things. I'm currently working on um, a, a kind of acoustic album after two albums that have been um, with a band and fairly, fairly heavy, I suppose. Uh, I'm, I'm trying to do something whereby I can go and work by myself with an acoustic guitar. I've just got an album that I'm about to release uh, called Raven Child, and that's got a. I, I tend to like working in slightly longer pieces or s song cycles, and I find that very satisfying to do. It's quite tough on the audience, but <laughs> they get into it eventually. <laughs> Fairly well, cold winter, and 